Welcome back. In Tuesday's video, we covered running back rankings 1 through 12 for fantasy football. I will run through them very, very quickly, but I suggest you watch the entire video to get full breakdowns on it. C-Mac at 1, Saquon, Bijan Robinson, Austin Eckler, Jonathan Taylor, Derrick Henry, Tony Pollard, Brees Hall, Josh Jacobs, Nick Chubb, Ramondre at 11, and Joe Mixon at 12. Today, we are ripping off the remainder of the top 24 running backs, so we're talking about the RB1s, and now the RB2s. 13 through 24. This is going to be a spicy video, which I have a feeling I'm going to rip on this mic for quite a long time. So I don't want to take up any more of your time. That's why we came pre-tucked already. You guys know the fucking rules. Tuck your shirts in before we start this video. Bunch of traps. And let's go. Make sure you're subscribed because on Tuesday we will be doing wide receivers 1 through 12 and then next Friday wide receivers 13 through 24. So if you're new here, welcome. If you've already been a guy here, welcome bike. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoy the video. Now, RB13 was one of the more difficult selections I feel like I've had in this entire uh, ranking group. And I actually settled on, this is going to be a surprise to I think a lot of people, Aaron Jones of the Green Bay Packers. Once again, one of the more underrated players in fantasy football. He was the RB10 last year in fantasy. He was a top 10 fantasy running back. He set career highs in rushing yards, targets, uh, receptions, and receiving yards. I just don't think enough people understand this. Now, the biggest question mark for sure is the fact that with A.J. Dillon there, how much work does he get on the goal line? What are his touchdown numbers? Because a dude like Aaron Jones, similar to an Alvin Kamara type, they are extremely efficient running backs, so you can give them you know, lowish volume of touches, and they still go crazy because of the number of touches they got on the goal line, the number of touchdowns they score in their peak years, which had always been the case, but was not the case last year for Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. Last year, A.J. Dillon had 10 carries inside the five. Jones had just three, but he did score five through the air, and this was one of the biggest points that a lot of people made last summer was with the deportation of Devontae Adams. I don't think that's the right word, but Sexy Pats is attempting to come back from Canada today. He's trying to get his visa, and I don't know if he got it or not at this time. By Friday, when you watch this, we'll know whether or not Sexy Pats is banned from the country for life, but we're hoping that he gets deported. Devontae Adams got deported. Do you see where the connection was here? Devontae Adams gets deported from Green Bay last year, and we're like, okay, Aaron Jones, you remember all those splits and those stats? Like, look how many catches and targets and receptions Aaron Jones gets without Devontae Adams in the lineup. Well, it obviously wasn't to that degree, but again, he set career highs in targets, receptions, receiving yards, had five scores through the air, and that is in large part because he lined up in the slot or outside on 21% of his snaps, which again was a career high, and I think they're going to continue using him in that capacity. Now, obviously, we're a little bit concerned about the direction of the offense under Jordan Love. We don't actually know what he is, but I'm actually a fan of him, and I think he's going to be fine, and I think he's sat behind Rodgers for long enough, and I think he will be a average, you know, give or take quarterback in the NFL, which is good enough for Aaron Jones to continue to succeed on, uh, on an offense with a consensus top 10 offensive line like they've had every year. Now, I'm not expecting to draft him thinking that he's going to be the RB2 in fantasy, right? Like those types of upside days are gone just because he's not getting 15 goal line carries a year. But I think by the end of the year, he'll be inconsistently good with big spike weeks of pass catching numbers and high efficiency numbers. And, you know, the same argument that everyone makes with Dylan, like if if if, a, if Aaron Jones gets hurt, Dylan is an RB1. If Aaron, if fuck it, Jesus Christ, if Dylan gets hurt, Aaron Jones is going to be a monster in fantasy this year year moving on to number 14 we have Najee Harris of the Pittsburgh Steelers he's just going to be a volume whore again I, don't, I really don't know what other points to make here for Najee Harris I still have a tough time just like buying into a player that I don't believe is great at football like I think year one could be fluky uh, it being inefficient as a running back two years in to start your career specifically at the running back position probably who you actually are at the position right like you look at guys who have had bad rookie years the Le'Veon Bells the Melvin Gordons and you're like okay a lot of volume a lot of hype coming into the rookie season didn't get it done year two they kind of explode didn't happen with Najee Harris and that's one of my concerns he's been sub four yards per carry in each of his first two seasons his fucking receiving volume dropped like Ryan Garcia which was predictable going into year two two uh he just had too much volume in year one they had too many weapons to give him the ball back again but they did improve their offensive line this offseason right they used their first round pick on Broderick Jones out of Georgia they signed some free agents and 
I also think the way that they finished last year is probably a predictor of how they want this offense to move and what they want to do and kind of hide Kenny Pickett. If you look at the splits of the first eight games versus the last half of the year, Najee Harris had just a, a, a ton of touches, right? Over 18 carries per game over the second half of the year, 21 opportunities per game. 0.78 touchdowns per game like he really had it going on in fantasy over the second half of the year if you drafted him you remember this because you were so pissed off at him over the first half of the year and then you're like oh you know thank you for performing over the second half of the year but you're too fucking late sir so now it's hard for me to have a positive outlook on Najee Harris I also think the other reason I'm a little bit hesitant is Jalen Warren is kind of awesome and just brings an explosiveness to that backfield that Najee Harris just absolutely doesn't. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Jalen Warren take a bigger role on in this offense. Like if you look at his efficiency numbers, number 12 in true yards per carry, number 11 in yards per touch, number five in juke rate, number 16 in breakaway run rate, number five in yards created per touch, top 15 in production premium, number two in expected points added, aka EPA. And you look at Najee Harris and what he is as a player, his breakaway run rate ranked outside of the top 50 last year. He just simply cannot Make, like he cannot produce a run of more than 15 yards. It's it, it's it's honestly weird. Uh, but he's still gonna see like 300 touches. He's probably gonna rumble into the end zone like eight to ten times. So it's like RB two, yeah, unexciting. Probably not as much upside. But if Kenny Pickett improves and this offense is great, I do think there's gonna be an underrated team overall. I think the Steelers are gonna like fight to be an actual competitor in the AFC this year, which they always are. But I think they're a little bit under the radar now. Najee Harris will obviously be a beneficiary of uh, of that. So I have him at 14, but I don't love it. I also don't love the next two guys, which I'd put in a tier together, Kenneth Walker and Travis Etienne. I have Kenneth Walker at 15, but I would split the difference on these two. And I think a lot of people would take Etienne over Walker easily because obviously they selected Zach Charbonnet in the second round of the draft this year, right? It took Rashad Penny going down during Kenneth Walker's rookie year for him to like really come into the lineup. But once he did, it was the fucking Kenny show, man. Five games of 100-plus rushing yards. Top 10 in pretty much every single statistical rushing category. Yards per carry, yards after contact per attempt, avoid attack, like all of it. Uh, he was tied for the NFL lead with 51 red zone carries. He was second in the NFL in red zone carries behind Jamal Williams. He had just 10 carries inside the five-yard line, um, and he turned just two of them into touchdowns. So I do think there's a lot of juice to squeeze there if he becomes the goal line back in terms of volume and efficiency and just touchdowns. Without Penny, you know, Charbonnet should take a lot of what he did there. I think Charbonnet is probably going to get a lot of the pass catching work. Not that, you know, Walker was someone that we relied on to do that in fantasy anyways, but Walker, what he does, here's the thing. Like, I think Walker is so good as a runner by himself that he'll be able to produce in fantasy as a top 15 back. He had 17 runs of 15 or more yards last year, uh, the third most among running backs and the most for a rookie running back since Saquon Barkley. And most importantly, like the team in Seattle is actually good. Uh, they hit on two different offensive line tackles last year in the draft, and they're going to be long-term starters. They got a center in free agency, and while Walker doesn't like catch passes, I feel like that was kind of known already in Seattle's offense, but he's just he's just kind of a beast, man. I, I think he could run for 1,200 to 1,300 yards. I think he can add in 20, 25 catches. I think he could run for 10 to 12 touchdowns this year. Charbonnet will obviously be a big part of that offense, but I don't necessarily think that it's enough to make me shy away from just how good Kenneth Walker was last year. So let's move on to Travis Etienne, Jacksonville Jaguars, my RB16. By most measures, uh, Etienne had a breakout that we were hoping for. Um, he showed explosiveness. He, he showed the ability to play on all three downs and at a large volume after they got rid of James Robinson. He led the NFL in 40 plus yard runs. He was top five in yards per carry, number four in avoided tackles per attempt. So he was just kind of awesome. He was elusive. He was explosive. He was all of it. And he's clearly the guy in an offense that is on the rise. Now, ETN didn't really take over until James Robinson uh, started to fade into oblivion. He didn't score a lot of touchdowns. He only had five of them, but it was not for a lack of attempts. Now, he had 43 red zone carries, which was top five in the NFL last year, 13 goal line carries, which was eighth in the NFL. Uh, he only converted three of those 13 goal line carries. So, yes, there's absolutely the point I made for Walker. Same thing for ETN. There is room for growth there. Now, the biggest concern for me is, I guess, twofold. One, I think, like, the addition of Tank Bigsby is going to go extremely, like, under the radar for a lot of normal fantasy players. I think Tank, Tank Bigsby is a good player. I think third-round capital tells me that they want him in the mix right away. And I think Doug Peterson's been extremely vocal about um, them using multiple running backs in that backfield. And that's going to be a problem for ETN in terms of, like, hitting that ceiling, hitting that upper limit of becoming, like, a top five, top six, top eight 
fantasy running back. I'm also concerned about his ability in the passing game. Like, I don't know if he's as, if he's that good, especially like as good as we thought he was coming out of Clemson. He caught a ton of balls there, but they were not very like efficient metrics and he wasn't really good last year. I think he's good enough to, to like back into one of those random receiving years that like Josh Jacobs has pulled out, Ezekiel Elliott, like 75 targets for fucking nothing. Like how I'm six foot five for nothing, couldn't make the fucking association. But Tank Bigsby being there scares me. He could be the thunder to the lightning here. He could be a goal linebacker. He, I feel like he is like ETN is more explosive and will give you the more, uh, more big plays. But Bigsby does... He can do the short yardage work. Uh, they could use him on the goal line. He can also catch passes probably just as well as ETN can. So I I, I wouldn't be surprised if we started to see series is where Tank Bigsby took like a full series with Trevor Lawrence. So that is my concern with ETN a little bit. ETN, I believe, I believe ETN had like 1,400 yards from scrimmage, five touchdowns, and still finished as like the RB22 in fantasy points per game, which is crazy and makes me even more hesitant about a guy like Jameer Gibbs, who is not next up on this list. Miles Sanders is number 17, Carolina Panthers. We were not wrong on Miles Sanders. We were just early. We knew he was a beast. We always done noted. Now he goes to Carolina on a four-year, $24 million deal. And among running backs with at least 400 carries since 2019, Sanders ranks first in EPA per rush, according to ESPN's Mike Clay. Now, last year, he obviously had his... His, his big breakout year with the Eagles before moving over to Carolina. 1,269 yards, 11 touchdowns on 259 carries. But man, the dude had fucking 78 receiving yards. 78 receiving yards. That is so bad. Uh, among fantasy running backs in the top 35 last year, among the top 35 fantasy running backs last year, only Jamal Williams had fewer receiving yards than Miles Sanders is 78. And only by five. And only because Jamal Williams had 10 fewer targets than Miles Sanders did, man. You really have to question Miles Sanders' receiving ability at this point. I mean, but listen, everything about the money and what Carolina is saying is that Sanders will operate as a three-down back. But one of the more underrated concerns for me is Deuce Staley there as the running back coach. Now, Sanders did play with Deuce Staley as a running back coach in Philadelphia years ago, and they used a committee there. And then, I mean, it was partly because of injury, but they still ended up getting to that point. And then Staley goes over to Detroit, and they use a committee again. So I'm a little bit nervous that Deuce Staley, who came out earlier this offseason in reference to Carolina's backfield once he got hired, saying that you do want multiple guys to touch the rock when they were talking about how he wanted to re-sign Deonta Foreman. Instead, they bring in Sanders, but he still said that. He came out and said, like, we want three good running backs. He goes to Detroit, and he uses a committee. And now, again, he's saying the same thing in Carolina. The other thing with Sanders, the other thing with Sanders that makes me a little bit nervous is a lot of his success last year was built on his 11 rushing touchdowns, obviously. And I do worry in Carolina that, like, I mean... Listen, he was behind an elite offensive line, behind an elite scoring offense. Carolina running backs last year, did they did eat quite a bit. Um, so I don't want to act like it's not possible, but I'm not overly high on Sanders moving to this new situation because I just, I'm just i not like sold that he's actually a good pass catching back, which is what makes me a little bit nervous. I'll, he, I'll be okay with him as my RB2 for sure, but I'm not, you know, I'm not penciling in him in for what he did last year. Now, I would like to think that J.K. Dobbins, who is my number 18 back, will improve upon last year he's he's a curious case man so much potential the upside that we saw at the end of his rookie season the last eight games where he went crazy and then a bit at the end of last year the 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 best part about Dobbins going into this year is that he's now two years removed from his ACL tear and I remember like all summer last year I had talked about how I can't wait to draft J.K. Dobbins in 2023. Like, I already know that J.K. Dobbins will be one of my most drafted players in 2023, but I'm staying away from him completely in 2022. And that feels to be the case. I don't know if I've completely moved up on him as high as I need to be. I don't think really anyone is at this point. But once he was healthy last year, he looked eh, he looked good enough. Uh, week 14 through the playoffs, he averaged over 100 yards from scrimmage per game, breaking off big runs, even if they looked fucking weird while he was doing it. I didn't look like he was 100% right, but again, now another six, eight months in the offseason behind him, he will be even that much more correct. Um, so I think he's going to be underrated. They have Gus Edwards, which I question if Gus Edwards has anything left in the tank. I don't know what else they have in Baltimore there, to be honest. I think it's just him and Justice Hill. I don't think they brought anything in at running back that was even in the top five or six rounds. So J.K. Dobbins probably going to be the guy. This is a reloaded offense. You know, obviously Lamar Jackson's back. Rashad Bateman's healthy. They bring in Odell Beckham, Zay Flowers, etc. So I am cautiously very optimistic about J.K. Dobbins. I am cautiously, very cautiously optimistic about Damian Pierce, who obviously had a very big breakout last year. 
I love Damian Pierce as a player. He I don't know if anyone was higher than Damian Pierce coming into the NFL draft last year as me. But, man, did they ask him to do a lot last year, and it clearly, clearly wore on him. He ended up with 220 carries, 940 rushing yards, four touchdowns, 39 targets, 30 catches, only 165 through the air, and another tugger. He was the RB22 in points per game. Um, only scored five touchdowns. But the biggest thing here was, like, their lack of concern with just giving him crazy touches. He played in 13 games, and he had 20 or more opportunities in nine of those 13 games. 69% of his games he had 20 or more opportunities 69 percent. it's not nice that's sexy that's what that is grow up stop acting childish this offense should be much better right like they bring in cj stroud as a quarterback they bring in shaq mason on the line john mechie will be back robert woods is brought in dalton schultz tank dell like they got way more explosion and way more weapons on the offense to move the offense more it'll be a little bit underrated my again my one of my biggest concerns is similar to like josh jacobs coming out of school neither of them operated as a workhorse at the college level so you question, can they stay healthy for a full season? Can they handle the workload? And I think in, for Josh Jacobs, it took a, a few years for him to get there. And for Damian Pierce, it clearly warned him efficiency-wise and injury-wise towards the end of the season. Like Damian Pierce never had more than 106 carries in a single four-year career at Florida. So that was my uh, concern with him. Now, I'm, I'm not like overtly targeting Damian Pierce in fantasy this year. I'm not fading him either. I don't. I, I think I'll probably take him at ADP when he comes to me because I think there are enough risks. There are enough um, concerns with him. He's a fourth round pick. They have a new coaching staff, so you don't know how great they feel about Damian Pierce. They bring in Devin Singletary, who has been a productive pass catching back, so maybe he takes that work away from him. I don't know. Um, I tweeted this out earlier today for absolutely no fucking reason. I don't think it's even relevant, to be honest. But since 2000, the year 2000, 35 running backs have gotten 250-plus touches as a rookie. On average, they get 19 fewer touches in year two. So not a big gap. But the average drop-off in touches in year two by those taken at pick 100 or later in the NFL draft is 66. Not a Damian Pierce tweet, all right? So leave him the fuck alone. He's my RB19. Going into RB20 is David Montgomery. And actually, after doing these rankings, I think I am going to swap those two. I think I already did in my rankings. And Montgomery's probably going to move up a little bit. They gave him three years, $18 million in Detroit. And listen, I get the hype for Gibbs, but with the departure of DeAndre Swift, I think the puzzle of this Detroit Lions backfield is it's just as simple as it looks. DeMont is a more talented version of Jamal Williams, and he fits right into that big banger back role. And you look at Jamal Williams last year, led the NFL in rushing touchdowns with 17, red zone carries with 57, 10 zone carries with 45. I mean, the next closest guy was mixing at 29, goal line carries with 28. The next closest running back was Zeke at 16. I mean, Jamal Williams at 262 carries last year. Projecting the 199-pound Gibbs to have the goal line work is just fucking pure insanity for no reason. I'm telling you, the puzzle is just as simple as it looks in Detroit, in that backfield. So I expect Emont to finish close to, I think like, 250 touches is reasonable, right? Jamal Williams had 262 carries, added 10 to 15 receptions. So he was over that, but let's let's play the reg regression game, right? Just to be safe. David Montgomery, 250 touches. You look at last year, the team had 507 RB touches. So Gibbs can still get in that 180 to 220 range, and they still have some left over. I think DeMont will see 12 to 15 goal line carries in that Jamal Williams role, which is a huge and reasonable dip off from the crazy number that Jamal Williams saw last year. But I still, I, I, I think still accurate and reasonable. And those like 12 to 15 goal line carries would rank annually inside the top like three to eight running backs in terms of goal line carries. So I don't know. I just really like the team. You look at last year, they were a top five scoring team in the NFL, 26.6 points per game in a format where it's like standard, a half PPR where touchdowns matter so much for running backs. Demont can go top 15 for this. So I love Demont as like my RB2 this year, a guy that I think is going to score uh, a ton of touchdowns. Number 21, we've got Cam Akers of the Rams. He finished really strong last year, the final four games of the season. Four 100-yard from scrimmage games to wrap up the year, averaging 21 touches per game during that span. I am always hesitant to bank on small sample sizes for fantasy, like we take the last three games or the last five games, and then we project it out for a full season. Very rarely works out that way, especially when we already have a full sample size of that same player being bad over a much longer stretch. That's a concern for me. Uh, if you want to argue about the Achilles finally being healed and that's why he started playing better, I'll listen to it. I think the better argument is just the fact that they have zero competition there, right? That's the biggest dub for me. They have Kyron Williams, the sixth round Zach Evans, who I like as a handcuff. I think he's interesting in Dynasty, but that's really it for being honest with ourselves. Ronnie Rivers, like it, it's all acres. The team itself has such a wide range this year. Like if Stafford and Cup are back, I think they could be pretty good. 
you know, maybe fight for a playoff spot. If Stafford's injuries, I think their defense is probably really bad too. Like if Stafford's injuries and age are too much to overcome, they're going to be an absolute fucking dumpster fire in LA this year. So I think there's definitely risk from a team perspective, from a player perspective. We just don't know what he looks like over the course of a fully healthy season. Like can he stay healthy for a full season? Uh, and the Rams have an objectively terrible, probably bottom three offensive line in the league I mean you look back at last year Cam Akers was second to last in the NFL in yards before contact per attempt only Kareem Hunt ranked lower than he did so he was getting eaten up as soon as he hit the line of scrimmage that being said where he's going right now according to underdog ADP he is the RB24 pick 76 I definitely think that worth that's worth the risk given the depth chart there in LA uh, given how we saw him finish last year if they don't add a veteran I think I, I don't know that feels like a very easy pick for me at pick 75, 77. Um, I could see a world where he is a fourth round pick, fifth round pick come the summer. A few hype reports out of camp that he's the guy there, you know, but who the fuck else is going to be the guy? All right. There's no one else there. So draft accordingly. Number 22. And after doing more research, I kind of want to move him down. I just don't know who else to throw over him at this point. I'll also say there are some situations kind of up in flux. I don't, I don't, like, I'm not ranking Dalvin Cook in this or Alexander Madison because I know they're saying they're probably going to cut Dalvin Cook, but, like, we'll sink that submarine when we get there. I'll believe it when I see it. So, for now, leaving both Minnesota backs off the list. Obviously, if Cook's gone, Madison's going to be much higher up in this list. If Cook is back there, he probably falls about into this range. I think he's probably close to fucking cooked out there in Minnesota, but no pun intended. 22, Isaiah Pacheco, the Kansas City Chiefs. It's going to be the Pacheco and the McKinnon show in Kansas City. He had, he had a he had an, uh, an awesome little breakout last year, especially for getting picked in the seventh round. 170 carries, 830 yards on the ground, five rushing touchdowns. Uh, admittedly, like after showing flashes in the preseason in the receiving game, he only caught 13 passes. He only caught 13 passes on the whole year. That was like almost exclusively Jarek McKinnon's role. They obviously just resigned Jarek McKinnon. They declined CEH's fifth-year option. He'll still be on the team for this year, but I don't think he plays much of a role, if any, in that backfield other than just like a breather back when they need one. Pacheco, I think I, I think the easy case to be made is he's like the big back, the early down back on the league's highest scoring offense, okay? Um, behind a very good offensive line. That's the easy case to be made. But when you look at the, the underlying metrics, I think there are a lot of things to be worried about as it relates to Isaiah Pacheco. I'm going to go through them here. There are a lot of numbers, so just, again, tuck in, take a breath, take a sip of water. And if you've been enjoying the video, the content, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. Again, we're doing wide receivers 1 through 12 on Tuesday, 13 through 24 on Friday. All right. So my concerns with Pacheco are twofold. Like, it's great that he is technically the goal line back in the league's highest scoring offense, but not when that offense just throws the ball at a crazy rate like Kansas City does. We They're like a circus when they get onto the goal line, okay? Last year, Pacheco had seven goal line carries. McKinnon had five. CEH had four. They had six non-running back goal line carries last year between tight ends and wide receivers and Mahomes. And then you have the passing. Mahomes attempted 73 passes inside the opponent's 10-yard line last year. The next closest quarterback was Kirk Cousins at 53, a full 20 passes fewer. And you look at inside the five, Mahomes threw the ball 35 times, okay? So you're already looking at, you if you look at pass to run inside the five-yard line, you're looking at a 61.4% pass rate on the goal line, which is a crazy, crazy high rate to begin with. And then you take that small portion of runs, which they operate on the goal line, 27% of, the, 27 of them weren't even running backs, okay? That's the problem. What's crazy is, although Mahomes led the NFL with 73 passes inside the 10-yard line, Pacheco did not have a single target inside the 10-yard line. McKinnon had 11 of them. Pacheco did not have a single target on third downs either. McKinnon had 20 of them, okay? So he is completely excluded on passing downs, especially near pay dirt. So I worry that Pacheco might, again, basically what he did last year, see 170, 185, 200 empty calorie carries where on the goal line, they involve everybody in passing situations. It's all McKinnon who they just re-signed and who was awesome for them last year in passing situations. So I would say buyer beware here, especially in PPR or even half PPR leagues. And since nobody plays in standard leagues, buyer beware. RB23, this is where things get dicey and you could just throw fucking anybody in here. I know a lot of you guys want to put Jameer Gibbs here and that's fine, I guess. Jameer Gibbs, I, Devon A-Chain might be getting a little bit too cute. Rashad White, Jamal Williams, uh, maybe like Brian Robinson. Eh. 
I went with um, <clears throat> James Conner. Oh, and James Conner is my RB23. This is fucking gross. I don't, I don't know. Like, who else are they going to give touches to? If Keontae Ingram, who had like 35 touches as a rookie, Corey Clement, Tyson Williams. Ugh. Yeah, we'll go Connor. Uh, he's like a low-end RB2 with literally no upside. He's he's like a low-end RB2 in my rankings who I would def- for sure not want to have as my RB2. He needs to be in my flex spot. He needs to be like my RB4, which doesn't make sense for this ranking. RB24, I actually like haven't really decided on anybody. Again, I think it's a toss-up between like Jameer Gibbs and who Jameer Gibbs replaced in DeAndre Swift. Uh, Swift in Philly, I think, could be really interesting. I think that could end up being like... Jalen Hurts doesn't throw to his running backs often. Like they have a very low target rate there uh, on the goal line. Jalen Hurts takes a ton of carries. I think DeAndre Swift is a super talented running back. Obviously, has trouble staying healthy. So um, I don't know how much work he gets in the passing game. I they, they use a, a ton of backs there. Like all Boston Scott is used. Rashad Penny's obviously going to be used. So it's like there's a ton of risk with Swift. So I like him at 24. Jameer Gibbs, I guess top 12 draft capital. I guess we'll put him here if he replaces Swift and he gets 200 touches. You know, he gets 70 targets again. I don't think he's going to get a lot of goal line backs. My biggest concern is like what I said with Travis Etienne, right? Travis Etienne, if I told you blindly this year that Jameer Gibbs saw nearly 50 targets, had 1,440 yards from scrimmage and scored five touchdowns, I think that is completely believable. I think that's a pretty good case scenario. That's what Travis Etienne had last year averaged a, a 10.9 half PPR fantasy points per game and that was the RB 23 in points per game on the year. Uh, obviously you can make the argument that Gibbs might catch you know 70 75 passes and those will be a little bit more worthwhile but I don't know again there's something I'm just a little bit hesitant on with Jameer Gibbs so RB 24 we'll slot him in there and we'll wrap up the top 24 running backs for today. Again if you miss 1 through 12 go check them out if you want to see the wide receivers 1 through 24 That'll be next week. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. We'll be doing fantasy football vids throughout the entire summer. I love y'all. Hope you enjoy today. I'm out of here.